Okay, let's get started. So, uh, what's tomorrow? Test. Test. Woo! Anyone else excited as I am? What? Sort of. Think of it like a game that uh, you're trying to win against me by trying to show me how smart you are. So try to think of it like a game uh, that may ease the pain a little bit. Um, oh, so I have one announcement about the final. So you may, you may have noticed on Piazza I posted about the, um, uh, the final exam change of dates because of a change of possible change of schedule. Uh, that is now permanent. So I will not be here on July 11th, I guarantee, because the flight's already booked. Um, so just go to Piazza and then vote on the poll for what we should do, because I'm open to both possibilities, to either have the exam entirely on July 10th, or and no class at all on the 11th, or to have half of it on the 10th and half of it on the 11th, and giving full time on both days for each of the parts. The reason I, I'll, I'm doing that possibility, even though I won't be here to grade the test, is that if we do the two day thing, the second day will be like multiple choice or something, so that the TA Varun can actually grade those independently of me. So. It uh, depends on what you want to do. Just go to the piazza and vote uh, which of these two would be best for you. But we can't have the whole thing on the 11th, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it would be effectively double the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, is it going to be the same exam? Uh, so I'm trying not to have multiple choice if I can help it. But if we do the double day thing, then I will have multiple choice. And historically, students do worse on multiple choice than on the other stuff. So I don't want to go along that route if I can help it. But uh, if we do have the two day test, then that's the only thing I can really think of. Or maybe something that's easy to grade that's not the multiple choice. It'll, I'll have to see what is best and how the class does on the first test. Uh, other questions about the test tomorrow or the final or, or anything in general? Uh, so, for me, we're going to track it on the end way and the only uh, graph enough, or we have to also write down the transition table. So, you mean contracting the graph? Making yeah, yeah, DFA if you ask the last question. So, like uh, making a DFA minimize, is that what you say? Uh, no, uh, I mean, can I just uh, leave a graph with the transition table? Oh, I have to write up my transition table. I'm not sure what give a graph without the transition table means. Uh, I think you need the formal definition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, so like give a formal specification and not the transition uh, diagram? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, you can do that too. So you're, you're never wrong by putting a formal specification on it. Uh, I'm not going to ask you that on the test because uh, that's not the point. The point is to be able to make the DFA in some way. So. Uh, if I give you a transition diagram, you should be able to convert it into a formal representation. But I won't ask you to do that or to actually produce the formal thing. Just the diagram is enough. Yeah, because you're limited on time anyway, so there's no point in like delving in formality, whereas I'm trying to test the concept, not the formality necessarily. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Could we do another topic level question? Okay, we can. Uh, uh, anyone want to do another pumping lemma question? Yeah. Yeah, unless you have a question. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, so everyone wants to. Okay. Um, anyone have an example you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. The, the zero one one thing, yeah. Okay. So <coughs> here's the language. So uh, 0, 1, 1 to the n plus 1, and 0, 1, 0, I think, to the n, where n is at least 0. <coughs> and it says on the test to show that this is uh, not regular. OK. 
Okay, so um, what tools do we have to show a language is not regular? Yeah, there's only one. So uh, let's do that. If there's one technique, we should probably use that technique. Uh, let's see. So how would I show that this isn't regular? Before we get to that. Assume it is regular. Okay. This, this sounds familiar to me. Assume L is regular. If I can spell regular, that'd be good. Uh, assume L is regular. Fine. So what do we do after that? Yeah, there's a pumping constant P. So why does there exist a pumping constant P? Just to refresh our memory of why, why we do this sort of thing. Oh, sir? Oh, we went a long enough string, but what does the P represent in the proof? So there exists a pumping constant P. I'll shorten it by saying there exists a P for L. But what does that actually mean? Instead of just like just writing it down like a recipe, there's a reason behind this. Yeah. Right. Because we assumed L is regular, what do we know about L? In a, in a DFA. So there's a DFA for L because we assumed it's regular. And the P here represents the number of states in that supposed DFA. So, um, so we're not, we don't think of DFAs in proofs like this, but just keep in mind why we say these sort of things. So if a professor comes up uh, in front of the class and tells you uh, a certain way of proving things and doesn't explain why, what should you do? Ask, why are we doing this? Instead of just blindly going with it and just saying, yeah, that's the way we're doing things and we're never going to deviate from this path. So why do we do this? Because we know from this first assumption there exists a DFA which has some number of states, P, and then we pick the string P uh, that has length at least P because we want the looping part in the DFA. Okay, so... After this, what do we do? We choose a what? A choose a string. Okay. So choose a single string. W equal. So here's a string. I'm going to show you a string. Oh, it's not in the language. Okay, I'll fix that. There, there's a string in the language. Is that a good string? No. No, why is it not a good string? It's not a length at least p. We don't know what p actually is. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's avoid that issue. So then let's pick, um, so, so that string's not good. So zero to the p, one to the p. Has length at least p. Ha ha, fixed your issue. Oh, it's not in the language. Why do we pick strings in the language? You see why I'm asking these things, yeah. Um, so that we can try and like, prove it. Let's try and like, prove it's not in the language by... Um, well, well, yeah, we'll show it's not in the language, but why does the original string have to be in the language? If it's regular, it's accepted. It's accepted by the DFA because think about what the condition at the end says. That if we go around that loop as many times as we want, we still stay in the language. Well, if I go around that loop exactly once, then we get the string that we want that we have right here. So if we go around that loop exactly once, and then we eventually go to an accept state. So we must pick a string long enough, obviously but it must also be in the language. So this string is not good either. So now you tell me, I failed twice. Tell me a string that works. Zero, one, one, uh, and then we'll pick P plus one of them. And then uh, zero, one, zero, and pick P of them. So it definitely has the length requirement fine. 
and it's in the language because the number of zero one ones at the front is exactly one more than the number of zero one zeros at the back. Okay, so it it satisfies both properties, and we're all set. Does this guarantee that this string will work? No. All we need is to show that there exists one string that works. Could there be exactly one string that works and no other ones work? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it could be that this string doesn't work. It will, but it could be that it doesn't. Uh, okay, so that's great. So what do we need to do next? And actually at this point, pay attention because a lot of students get this next part wrong. So pay attention. What do we do next? Oh, before that. De the decompositions. So, do we need to look at all decompositions into three parts or just one? All decompositions. So, so don't do what I'm about to do, okay? Just so you know. And I'll, in fact, I'll do it in red and say, don't do this. Okay? Don't do this. So, I'm going to look at all decompositions because that's what we have to do. So, let's look at x equal to 0, 1, 1 to the alpha, so mirroring the other proofs we did, uh, 0, 1, 1 to the beta, and then uh, z is, well, we have uh, p plus 1 to start with, uh, then minus alpha minus beta, and then 0, 1, 0 to the p afterward, because we never touched those. So note, remember that x and y together have length at most p, so the x and y part are, are both contained within the 0, 1, 1 prefix. They never touch the 0, 1, zeros at the end. So we're fine there. Cool? What's wrong with this, anyone but Andrew? Uh, p is not well, well, okay, well, uh, so I'll say that alpha is at least 0, Beta is at least one, and um, and and we'll, I won't I won't uh, explicitly say anything about alpha and beta, but we know that x, y, whatever alpha and beta are, the total length is at most p. So so let let's not try to uh, uh, hammer on that issue. There's something else more fundamental. What is the length of x always for this decomposition? Pick alpha equal to 0. What is the length of x? 0. Pick alpha equal 1. What is the length of x? 3. Pick alpha equal 2. What is the length of x? 6. Can the length of x be anything other than than a multiple of three in, the, in these decompositions. <clears throat> but could there be a decomposition where x does have length one or two or four or five? Could x have those, de could a x have those decompositions? We need to treat all decompositions. Okay, could x have length one? Yes. It doesn't have to have a multiple of three. This is just a, these things in the language are just strings. They, they're not subdivided into length three substrings. So it's a, literally a red herring to say that x is always a multiple of three in length and y is also a multiple of three in length. It could be that x has some multiple of three and one additional character or two additional characters. So, in fact, there are other cases that this does not cover. So, it could be that x is 0, 1, 1 to the alpha with a 0 after it. Or, uh, x is 0, 1, 1 to the alpha and then a 0, 1 after it, but not the next one. Okay? So, these three cases are possible. And independently, y also has three cases because y doesn't have to be a multiple of three in length. It could be a multiple of three and one character or a multiple of three and two characters. How many possibilities in total is that if x has three possibilities and y independently has three? 
What is three times three? Nine. Do you think we want to deal with nine cases? <coughs> no. It, it can be done, but well, let's do your question first. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the uh, what you're, I think what you're saying is, and uh, tell tell me if I'm wrong, that there are many cases to deal with. Like, why could have one ones, and then we need to do something special for them, or, or are you saying something else? No, I'm saying it's dependent on the, uh, what's being used for x. It's dependent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if uh, x f falls evenly with a multiple of three then y must start with a zero, but then y has three choices. If x falls on the zero and then the y starts on a one, then three choices there. Yeah, so there are, there are many things we need to be able to worry about because y could have multiple things of what it starts and ends with. So it can be done. I'm not saying it's uh, impossible to do, but I don't think you want to deal with nine cases. Okay, so let's think about it a different way. So let's see. D doesn't matter. Let's think about annual decomposition at all. So it doesn't matter what the decomposition is. But what is the length of y at least always? I'm literally holding it up. One. So y's length is always at least one. Well, think about it in the extreme case where y does have length exactly one. Well, it could be that y is the zero is one of the zeros in the first part, or it's a one in the first part, or the other one. But it is zero one one repeated, so it doesn't matter which zero we consider or which one we consider. It's one of those two. Well, what if I take out one of the zeros in the in that first part? What happens to the number of zero one ones? If I take away a zero, and maybe other things, but I take away at least one zero, what happens? Uh, no, no, what happens to the number of zero one ones? It changes. Namely, it goes down. And then, for that reason, we don't have exactly n plus one number of zero one ones. It maybe it's less, but we don't know the exact number. So, uh, what if we delete, what if y instead was one of the ones instead? Would the number of zero one ones change also if we dropped it out? Yeah, that would change too. Oh, so no matter what the decomposition is, pump down, take out that copy of y, then no matter what happens, the number of zero one ones must go down. And so, Therefore, we can't have exactly one more 0, 1, 1 thing at the front than the number of 0, 1, zeros in the back. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, what if you, for whatever reason, didn't think of 0? What if you said, oh, I'm going to pump up the 2? Well, let's see. What if y contains a 0 in the front and I put another 0 in there? What happens to the string itself? Well, what would happen is we would, in somewhere in the string, we have a 0, 0, 1, 1 somewhere. Is that of the form a bunch of 0, 1, 1s together followed by 0, 1, zeros? Is that of that right form? No, because every 0 on the left side is separated by two 1s, whereas this, this does not hold. So we have a structural problem. What if um, y contains one of the ones? Uh, y contains a one. What happens then? <coughs> well then, if I put in another copy of y, then what's going to happen is I'm going to have a 0, 1, 1, 1. Is that of the form 0, 1, 1's at the front? No. Is that all the cases? If we pumped up, what if y then has is just a zero one one set substring? So if uh, 
the final case is if y is zero, really is zero, one, one to the beta as the final case. Well, what happens here if I put in another copy of y? We don't have the structural problem anymore of like a zero, zero appearing or a one, one, one appearing. We don't have that issue here if we put in another copy of y. But what if we did here? If we put in another cop, another zero one one at the front, what happens? Yeah, it's going to be at least n plus two number of zero one ones at the front, but that's not in this language because it's exactly one more. Okay, so um, yeah, so if you think that there's going to be a lot of cases, there won't be on the test, so don't worry about that. But uh, if there happen to be, then try to think about it a different way instead of just looking at this at a recipe point of view and say, oh, just x equal to this, y equal to this, because this is a red herring, saying that it must fall on, an e on a multiple of three number of characters evenly, it, and it can't uh, go in between them, okay? So that's just what I want you to see. But by pumping down... We always take away a copy of 0, 1, 1, and so the string leaves the language for that reason. Any questions about this? Okay, any other questions? Yeah? So what was the solution of this? What do you mean? Yeah, we picked i equals zero. Okay. The the solution to this is in is in the sample test, by the way. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, but we picked i. So in fact, any value other than one will work. If we picked i equals zero, it's the easiest one. But if we picked i equal two, you have to do a little bit more work. But uh, because of these other two cases, but if we picked i equals zero, then uh, the number of zero one ones must drop by at least one. And so it leaves the language for that reason. Yeah. So instead of doing that, you said you, you should not do this, right? Go on and write. Yeah, yeah. Now what should we do? Yeah, so the thing is here, there are nine cases. So I don't think you want to write out nine cases of formal notation like this. So write it in English. So if you're treating all decompositions in the same way, just say, uh, let x, y, z be an arbitrary decomposition and then pump down to i equals zero and then see what happens. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't do it at a completely formal level. Uh, other questions? I think there was one over here. Okay. Yeah. Of course, I'll remember exactly what question that is. That no, it's, it's fine. So what was the question? You don't have to come up, but oh, sorry. Uh, well, it is it's really long. Uh, uh, for that, of state I in uh, AFA, there be an after division from state as belong to. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I know that one. I I wrote the test. I have to remember my own questions. Uh, okay, so uh, epsilon closure. So if we have a uh, set S right here, um, if we have a transition that goes like this, that goes from the, so S is a set of states. So if we have an epsilon transition that goes out of here, what do we do with this state out here? Do we include it in the epsilon closure? Yeah, because it says go from the set of states S that you have and then branch out on all the epsilon transitions as far as you can go. Um, so, so then we include that state in E of S, the epsilon closure of S. What if that we have a transition that looks like this, that's, uh, where both states are outside of S? Yeah, yeah we, we, we don't do anything. If we eventually include the, the tail of that transition, the state on the left, then we will include the other one. But uh, if both of them are out, we don't include that one. So the question asks, 
What if we have a transition that goes inward into here? Do we include the outer state? No, why not? Because remember, epsilon closure is where you can reach, not the things that can reach you. Okay? So uh, here we do not include this. Include in E of S. It's from the practice test. Uh, I forget which question. I think 14? Yeah. So it's one of the true false ones in there. It's just understanding what epsilon closure means and when you should uh, put a state in the epsilon closure and when you shouldn't. Other questions? Yeah. To, yeah, so I equal, uh, I mean, I would look at the sample test for the conclusion, but what you could say is um, uh, pump down to I equals zero, and then, so the number of zero, one, ones must drop. So the resulting string cannot have exactly one more zero, one, one at the front than the zero, one, zeros in the back. And so the resulting string then cannot be in the language and therefore it isn't regular. That's a, that, that's a way you can end it. So remember, it, it's not like um, 243 where you just write down a formal process, write basic step, inductive step, and then completely formal notation, and then, uh, then the proof is done. That's not how we do things here. We try to communicate the proof in a concise but formal way so that the person can understand it also. So if you write it in English, but also write it precisely, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, then uh, that's what we are trying to strive for. Okay? Yeah. So last question about uh, question three. So the zero one one to the P plus one power, that is, is that X, Y? No. So, so th that's not any decomposition at all. So this, this is literally the string itself, the string we're trying to analyze. X, Y is some prefix of the string of length at most P. And, and so that's all we really know. And where, where Y is not empty, of course, but yeah. But, and that's all we really know. Other questions? Okay. So... What, have, what are we starting to talk about last time? I guess were is the right uh, verb tense. Chomsky yeah, Chomsky normal form for what? DFAs? Uh, CFGs. Oh, what are those? Charles French Gaulle Airport? <laughs> yeah, context free grammars. So. Um, okay, so why did we even start talking about uh, Chomsky normal form in the first place? Too much silence, yeah. Yeah, so we, we wanted to get away from ambiguous grammars if possible. And I mentioned that it's not possible to do in general, but maybe we can get some of the way there. And one important string that we've been talking about is the empty string. If we can at least get um, a rid of ambiguity for the empty string, that could be really useful. But along the way, we also showed that if we want a grammar in, in uh, CNF, in Chomsky normal form, then... If I'm not generating the empty string, then every variable that I'm going to generate must generate something of the string because we guarantee that these other variables are not the start variable. So there's no way to get them to not generate the empty string. So what is CNF, the definition itself?
So what rules am I allowed to have in a grammar that's in CNF? Yeah, so we're, we allow the start variable to generate epsilon, so we're allowed to do that, because we, we got to get that string somehow, so we're letting you do this one way. Uh, what are the other types of rules we're allowed to have? You cannot call the start. Yeah, yeah, we can't call the start uh, variable, but what are the rules looking like? Uh, what do the other types of rules look like? Variables to terminal. Yeah, yeah, a variable, any variable to a single terminal. Uh, so, because we got to get a single terminal uh, to get the context-free languages. Um, but what are the other types of rules? Yeah, A goes to uh, BC, and what do we qualify on BC? Yeah, that they're not the start variable. So B and C are not the start variable. So whenever we apply a rule that goes from one variable to two, then those two variables must generate something. They can never generate the empty string because they're not the start variable. Fair enough. So what were the steps that we did last time to try to get a grammar to, into CNF? What did we do last time? So let's actually do start fresh from an example so that we can uh, complete it today. So I'm going to, so, so what example did we do last time? Like SS and oh, oh, with the SS one, okay. So we had this one, I think. Yeah, so I'll do it this way. Okay, so what was the first step to try to get it into CNF? Yeah, a new start variable. Why did we want to make a new start variable? To to make to entice this to go to CNF. Because the start is in the right, the start's on the right hand side of a rule, so that that's one of the basic things of CNF saying you can't do that. Okay, so we made new start variable. And we did this by putting a new rule with a new variable, that's the new start variable, <coughs> called S0. And the only rule that is associated with it right now is it just makes the original start variable. And all the other rules are present. So nothing actually changed other than this new rule that we're adding. Okay, and we showed that this doesn't change the language of the grammar. Because if we change the language of the grammar along the way, I can't claim that we can convert any CFG into CNF, which is what we want to actually show. Okay, and then what was the next thing that we did to get it closer? Yeah, try getting rid of the epsilon. Could I just strike out the epsilon rule and then claim victory? No, because for this grammar in particular, uh, it wouldn't be able to generate anything. So what did we do to be more smart about this? Find all the weak. Yeah. We plug in epsilon where the S's are on the right side. Yeah, so, yeah, so we saw, oh, S can generate the empty string, so any place where S could appear, let's simulate the possibility that it could have went to the empty string with another rule in which it does directly. So we don't have the S to epsilon rule, we're simulating it with other rules. So uh, is it enough to just say S can generate the empty string? What else can generate the empty string in this grammar? S0, why? Right, because the it's only the rule associated with it has only variables on the right side, and each one of them can make the empty string. What did we call variables that can make the empty string here? Nullable. So we uh, 
So our goal was to eliminate the epsilon rules. And we created this list of nullable variables. And in this case, both variables are nullable. Because S directly makes the empty string, whereas S0 indirectly through S can make it. Okay, so uh, I'll try to attempt to recreate the grammar that resulted. So it was, we get rid of the S to epsilon rule when we're done. So we have this or uh, just the single pair with no variable on the inside or SS. I think that's the grammar we ended up with. And correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Is this grammar in CNF? No. No. What's wrong with it? <laughs> yeah, a lot of things. Uh, ever encounter a situation where there's so much wrong with it that you just have to start over? Uh, we're trying to not have to start over here, thankfully. So, uh, what is one thing in particular that's really wrong here? There's terminals and variables. Yeah, there's terminals and variables on the right side, but we actually talked about a way to fix those uh, uh, last time, which was to make a variable for each of the terminals and have and replace the original occurrences of them with that new variable and then the new variable makes the single terminal so it's like an indirect way of doing the same thing so we can fix that but there's a an, another issue with the s0 variable what is it well it's not the epsilon rule because that's okay what else is wrong? It's the S0 to S rule. What's wrong with it? What does CNF allow to have on the right side? Single terminal or two variables. Did I say one variable? Oh, this is one variable. So this thing here is called a unit rule. So a unit rule is exactly one variable and nothing else on the right side. Okay? What do we want to do with unit rules to get it closer to CNF? I mean, it's exactly what the other thing is. You can just put it up there all. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. But, but in general, what do we want to do with unit rules? Eliminate them. Thank you. So we want to eliminate, quotes, uh, unit rules. What if I just deleted it outright? What would be the language of the grammar? The, the empty string. Because that's the only rule, of course. I can't get down to S. Okay, so we got to, again, be smarter. So the suggestion was... Oh, well, couldn't we just copy the rules corresponding to S upstairs? So just copy the three rules with S to where the S is upstairs. Would that be okay? It seems reasonable. And in fact, it'll work. So I'm actually going to do something kind of smart, and you'll like me more because of this. I hope you like me. Um, Sound desperate? <laughs> okay, so if we do this, then I could write all three of these out again, but with the magic of simplification, do that. Are you impressed by that? I hope you're impressed by that. Or epsilon. Okay, so we can just copy rules around. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so here's, here's an issue with this. What if we have more variables and the grammar's more complicated? And by more complicated, I mean uh, we have a variable A, which goes to B, and then somewhere else, another 
rule, which is B goes to A. What do we do then? So there is a formal way to do this, but I'm sure you probably don't want to delve into that sort of thing. So what would you do if you see a, a cycle like this, which A goes to B and then the other way? What would you do? What you would do is, let's just say we're copying the B, the rules corresponding to B upstairs to where the A to B rule is to fix the unit rule on top. Well, what we're going to get is an A to A rule. Should we get rid of that? Yeah, if a variable just makes itself and is not useful, there's no point in keeping it. Okay, so what you can do is you can copy everything up except and then delete that extra rule. And then what do you do? You copy everything back down and then delete and then delete duplicates, as the case may be. So uh, that's actually a very simplified way of saying what the formal method actually does. But all you really do is you just copy rules around. Uh, and then all we're really doing is we're simulating the unit rule through other ones. Just like the epsilon rules, we're just simulating it with another one. Do we change the language by doing this, though? Well, let's think. If we use, it in a derivation of a string, we use one of those unit rules in the original grammar. Well, what do we do here? We're replacing it by another rule that the, the variable it would have generated would have generated itself. So we're shortcutting it by, instead of applying the unit rule and then the next rule after that, we're shortcutting it to the, the rule after it. So in fact, we don't change the language as a result because we're just simulating one rule with another one. Okay, any questions about how that works? Great, so we don't have um, start variable on the right side anymore, which is which is one of the thing one of the tenets of CNF. We don't have epsilon rules other than possibly the start variable making it, so we're done with that. We don't have any rule where there's exactly one variable on the right side and nothing else. Do we do this when we have one variable and one terminal on the right side? Or do we only do it with one variable and nothing else? So if I have a rule like uh, A goes to little a capital B, do I do this unit rule replacement with that rule? No. What is a unit rule? Yeah, so it's exactly one variable. Uh, do I do this replacement when there are two variables on the right side? No. So, in fact, we only do it when there's exactly one. So, what is the situation we have now? The situation is, um, if it's just variables on the right side, there's at least two of them. Because we got rid of the ones that have exactly one, which is great. Um, what if, could we have a mix of terminals and variables, though, on the right side? Yeah. Uh, in fact, we have uh, several of them. So how do we fix those? So uh, fix right-hand sides that are mixed. And by mixed, I mean uh, terminals and variables on, on the right side. So, so what, do we, what would we do here in this grammar? What, what would we do to fix the rules that have the left S and the right? What would we do there? Variable. Yeah, so we would create a variable that makes only those terminals and then just replace those terminals upstairs with those uh, variables that we just made. So let's actually do this. So I'm going to make two variables called, um, yeah, let's do u and x. So I'm going to, sorry. I'm going to pick better variable names, which is what you should do in your programming too. Um, I'm going to have L make the, le the left one and R make the right one. And then what do we do upstairs? 
we replace the occurrences upstairs. So we would have LSR or LR or SS. And then the S0 has the same thing or epsilon. Great, so uh, all we're really doing is we're substituting terminals for a variable. Does that make sense? What if we had a rule like this? A rule that uh, a variable makes the left one. And let's just say I'm gonna replace that with the corresponding variable because that's what the method said to do. Should I do that? No. No, why not? It's already in the, in the format that you want to do. Oh, what are we reintroducing by doing this? A unit. A unit rule. So we should only fix the right-hand sides when we have a, the right-hand side length at least two. So if they're, the length of the right-hand side is at least two, then we do the replacement. If there's only one, then it must be a terminal because we got rid of the variable ones. So if there's just one terminal, leave it alone. Don't touch it because we don't want to reintroduce unit rules. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so uh, is, this, is this grammar in CNF? We're, we're very close though, I can tell. So what is the issue? LSR. Yeah, LSR. Uh, which, the Life Sciences Building, LSR? Anyone? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think a building is this, of that name. So, what is wrong with it specifically? Three. Yeah, it has three variables, but we require exactly two. So, let's actually fix the right-hand sides. Uh, right-hand sides that are long. Well, the good thing at this point is there's no right-hand side that's long that has terminals in it. Because if it had a lot of terminals in it, then we uh, fixed it in the previous step by uh, converting them to variables and then using the variables there. Um, so the only case when a right-hand side is long is when it has only variables on the right side. So in the case of the LSR rule, uh, what would we actually do? What would we do to simulate that rule? Yeah, so what we would do is we would make a brand new variable. And what would we do in this case? Oh, so what's one possibility? Okay, yeah, so that's one way we can go. So let's make a brand new variable. I'm gonna call it y1. So I'm gonna have the brand new variable y1 in the place of ls. And then the r is gonna stay there because I need two variables. <coughs> and then y1 is gonna make ls. Here's the key. This y1, should it have another rule associated with it? Because I don't want to make too many variables. Here's the thing. What if we had uh, an s go to uh, rsl, for example? Th this is not in the grammar. This is just uh, for sake of argument. Well, let's just say I was stingy, or more stingy than I am. Uh, and then I'm going to say uh, S is going to go to Y1 again with an L, and Y1 is going to generate the RS. So Y1 has two rules associated with it. What's wrong with doing both of these in the same grammar? Well, let's see. Look on the left. With the S go to Y1R, could I apply the RS rule associated with Y1? Yeah. <coughs> So, and I don't have the rule RSR before. So then I'm actually changing the language of the grammar as a result. So what we should do is if we see a rule of, of a certain type like RSL, I'm going to make a brand new variable each time. 
So I'm going to make our uh, y2 instead of y1. So whenever you make a brand new variable here, make sure it only corresponds to one rule and no other ones. Okay, great. Um, what if we have a right-hand side that's really long? So like um, LSR, LSR, as an example. What would we do here? There are actually a lot of things that we could do. But what is a straightforward algorithmic way to do this? And I promise we'll break after this. Uh, you can split it in half, but I want this to be algorithmic, and I don't want to have to look at the right side to figure out what to do. What's that? Yeah, yeah, we can do the leftmost ones. So we can replace, say, the ls by y1. And then what do we do? We have s goes to y1r, lsr. And then what do we do after that? We can say, um, then these two are going to correspond to y2. So then we'll have the rule... Uh, S goes to Y2 LSR, Y2 goes to Y1R, and um, Y1 goes to LS. So we can um, chew our way through the right side one variable at a time and add a new variable at a time. So if you look at this rule, if you want to apply it, then you're going to have a y variable on the right side, but then you're going to be forced to go through this chain of rules until you pop out the other side. So it's effectively doing the same rule, but just with a lot of other rules. Okay? Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, ask. So why can't you do LSR? You, you can. So... Um, for the purposes of algorithmics, um, it would be better to have a simple procedure that works in all situations. But if you wanted a small grammar, you're right. I could split down the middle, put the same variable on the both sides, and have each one make LSR and then deal with that at the end. But um, I want this to be algorithmic. But you're absolutely right, we can. Yeah? What's the purpose again of having only two rules on the right hand side? Two variables on the right side? two variables because I can't make it any simpler than that because if we just have one variable we're back in regular grammar land so we gotta pick at least two and because of this we can get exactly two but another reason is when we actually will show that some languages are not context free we want to know the structure of the parse tree itself and by knowing the structure we know that each node will have exactly two children, which is what it is here. So there are many reasons why. Uh, other reasons, yeah. So this uh, charms can only form only gives us CFGs that aren't regular? No, no. So we can apply this with regular grammars too. Think about applying the, uh, this, this five-step process to regular grammars. Is there a step we can skip? Yeah, so the step five, if we apply it with a regular grammar, we can skip step five. Because with a regular grammar, there's no long right-hand sides. But we can apply it with a regular grammar in the same way. <coughs> because it's the same structure, essentially. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we can do that. Is you can do that. You can replace it in any way you want. It's just that if you want to show correctness, you need to be able to do it in an algorithmic way. But if you have an, an, an example grammar, yeah, you can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I know you're dying for a break. Not literally, but... Uh, okay, so let's break. <laughs>